So next up is Frank Corsetti from USC. Frank is a professor of geobiology in the department. Um, and uh, we'll start off. Uh, we're a little bit early in terms of time, but that's OK. Um, and we'll take it away. Frank. Thanks. I want to uh, thank you all for coming. Thank the organizer for, for giving me the opportunity to speak. And uh, this is the title I was given, Evaluating Biosignatures in Planetary Analog Systems. Uh, I thought I'd give a plain speak title, Searching for Signs of Life in Rocks on Earth, in case that's useful for searching for life elsewhere. Um, I'm just perplexed by all the NASA you know, acronyms and words and long words. So whenever possible, I try to speak plainly. Um, this is supposed to be a 101 thing, so I think many of you have heard these concepts that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you my sort of impressions of these concepts. I want to start with the word biosignature. What is a biosignature? And to me, it's just a sign of life, um, broadly defined. And I'm hoping um, that this week is going to be a lot of fun talking with each other on how we can sort of um, learn what we each think is a biosignature and then come up with you know, some really in interesting um, conclusions. Uh, where I work is mainly in the fossil record. So what's a fossil? Uh, for me, a fossil is a record of ancient life. We could quibble about, you know, well, does it have to be 100 years old? Or, you know, what does it have to be? Um, for me, it's just ancient life. If it's dead, it might as well be a fossil. Um, for me, I work on ones that are preserved in rocks. And for me, that's a specific kind of biosignature. Uh, I like to show this dictionary uh, definition of fossil any remains, impressions, or trace of living thing of a former geologic age as a skeleton footprint, et cetera. This is just from the web, and actually it contains a lot of interesting information in it that I want to talk about. Uh, a fossil can also be a markedly outdated or old-fashioned person or thing. Hopefully, I'm not that today. Um, I think we can all look at these things and not quibble that these are evidence of past life. Does anybody want to quibble? OK, good. Now, one of the reasons we can say that, we could talk about morphologic complexity. Both morphologic and complexity are loaded terms, so maybe we don't want to do that. But we could talk about that. Or we could just talk about, um, well, we have dragonflies today that are alive. So we look at that, we know that's a, that's a sign of life, because we can see living representatives today. Sure, there are extinct organisms that don't have modern um, you know, modern living relatives, but uh, their shape gives them away. Um, but that definition from the web had some interesting concepts in it. And I think it, by going over these, it helps focus um, when we talk about biosignatures, what are we talking about? So with respect to fossils, I break them into three groups, uh, body fossils, trace fossils, and chemical fossils, um, with examples of each here. And um, for me, I focus on these two, and I collaborate with people that do this. Okay, so um, I consider these morphologic biosignatures. I also sometimes call them structural biosignatures because it's a shape. But as Karen alluded to, you know, shapes can be deceiving. So let's look at, you know, what, what do we consider a body fossil, what, what's a trace fossil? A body fossil is, is literally the physical remains of an organism, a shell, a bone, um, something like petrified wood. This is actually um, uh, microbial fossils. Those are, we don't know what they were. They were probably some kind of cyanobacteria, but we don't know for sure. But that's a microscopic fossil. It, it is literally the body of ancient microbes. Um, and these inform about sort of the functional morphology. What could it do? You can look at the shape and then discern what could it do. Um, you could also look at modern organisms to help you do that, but that's the kinds of things that body fossils will tell you. What could it do when it was alive? Um, trace fossils are evidence of the activity of a past organism. You know, the classic example would be a footprint or a worm trail, um, where it's not the actual body of the organism, the past organism itself. It's evidence of its activity, and in my mind, I. I like to separate, OK, what does the, the body look like? What does the trace look like? Because there are two ways to uh, approach looking for ancient life. 
Uh, and the trace fossil, of course, informs what the organism did and how it interacted with the environment. And that, that part there, how it interacts with the environment, again, I think it's something to keep in mind when we're talking about biosignatures. Because it's one thing to look for the thing, the body. It's another thing to look for the evidence of the activity that was there. You might not have the body anymore, so you're looking for the evidence of the activity. Again, I'm coming from the fossil record. I'm coming from life that's already dead and in rocks. But I think it has relevance for looking for extant life or the activity of extant life. And then chemical fossils would be chemical evidence of, of past life. Or, you know, in the, if you're looking for extant life, chemical evidence of that life. Um, and, you know, we can talk about that more during the week, but I'm focusing on what I'm calling the morphologic um, biosignatures. What about this? So here's an Archean rock. You've got some ripple marks up here. That's when the waves go back and forth and leave little ripples. And then we've got these columnar structures. And I've zoomed in on that. Is that a biosignature? Does anybody know what that is? And do you think it's a biosignature? This is the audience participation part. <laughs> OK, it's a stromatolite. How many people have heard the word stromatolite? OK, my work is done. No. Um, is it a sign of life? If you saw that on Mars, I know we would all be excited. Is it a sign of life? Let's investigate this structure a little more. So in terms of my background coming, coming in here, I might even, it, it might be preposterous to say that I'm a stromatolitologist. So let's look at this kind of fossil. What kind of fossil is a stromatolite? Since you all know what a stromatolite is, is it a body fossil, a trace fossil, or a chemical fossil? It could have chemical fossils, sure. Is it a body fossil or a trace fossil? I, th I think uh, the pendulum would swing towards trace fossil. It's the evidence of activity, and I'll, I'll show that uh, in a minute. Um, so if you looked in a textbook, and many of you might have had a, a, a Geology 101 or even a Biology 101 class where they talked about stromatolites, um, it's a laminated. So here are the laminae. It's got lines. Uh, organo sedimentary structure, so it's a sedimentary structure, but it's in, interacting with life somehow, and it commonly attributed to microbes, and specifically um, things like filamentous cyanobacteria are called out as stromatolite builders, but they're not the only ones, but they are typically called out. Like, for example, this one from Yellowstone National Park, where we have what would be a light lamination here composed of microbial filaments. These are cyanobacterial cyanobacterial filaments, and then a dark lamina here, which is composed of uh, cyanobacterial filaments that are lying down. So these are sort of standing up. These are lying down. That's, that's what would presumably make one of these laminations. If this is all there is to it, then yes, stromatolites are biosignatures. And if we find one, we're stoked. Um, think of it like this. So here is a microbial mat uh, dominated by cyanobacteria from Catalina Harbor. It's being grown up in a tank on, the, uh, on Catalina at the uh, Wrigley Institute, USC's Wrigley Institute, in their seawater tanks there. And you can imagine that um, if you had a wave come by and sediment was dumped on top of this mat, it would not be happy anymore because these are photosynthetic organisms. So they would glide up through the, um, the sediment and make a new layer. And that's what we did here. So let me orient you. We're looking down on, you can see the green there, the mat. We're looking down on the mat, and we've uh, dumped aquarium sand on top of it, purple aquarium sand, and watched it for 12 hours. So what's happening? The cyanobacteria, first of all, they're metabolizing. They're making oxygen, and they're gliding up through um, and making what would be a new layer on top of that. And if we looked at that in side view, it might look something like this one from uh, the Ediacaran of Death Valley. Approxim let's just throw out a word, 580 million years ago in Death Valley. So it's not surprising to think that you look at a stromatolite and you automatically think it's a biosignature. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes. Here's the nice one from, there's this, the butt end of a Sharpie 
This is a nice one from the Green River Formation in Wyoming. It's about 50 million years old. Um, here is one uh, from the Belt Supergroup. You can see a lens cap for scale. And this one's conical. Here's a domical one. Do you see the scale? So scale is not in the definition of a stromatolite. They can be big. They can be uh, tiny. These are ti that's a centimeter for scale. These are tiny little columns, also from the Green River Formation. Uh, if we look at a thin section, which is a primary tool that I use, so we, we cut a paper-thin uh, microscope slide of these rocks and where you can actually see through it. And we look at them in a uh, thin section, and we can see different morphologies. I'll highlight some of these morphologies in a minute. Um, sometimes they're very simple. Sometimes they're very complex. Sometimes they're on the run. These are oncoids, so they're circular, and they rolled around, but they accreted in the same way that um, these other structures accrete. So yeah, if indeed that is the only way to make a stromatolite, they're biosignatures. I think you're sensing the but in my statement, right? We're, why do we care about stromatolites? They are, uh, the oldest accepted stromatolite is uh, about 3.5 billion years old, and it's considered some of the oldest evidence for life on Earth. There are some that are slightly older. I call them the possibly older stromatolites. Um, but the, the actual um, uh, uncontroversial ones are about 3.5 billion years old. Um, so they're the oldest fossils in the world, if they're biosignatures. Um, they are macroscopic manifestations of microbial processes. So the microbes are probably too small for a rover to drive up to and see. But the structure that they build, again, if we consider it a trace fossil, the structure they built is big enough to see. So they're sort of always been in the back of our minds with respect to sending a rover to Mars or elsewhere and being able to see something that was evidence of microbial life. That's why we care about them. I've been thinking about this problem for a long time. I want to tell you a story about a talk I gave in 2008. You're like, oh, God, 2008? It's ancient history. Uh, it was called A Tale of Two Stromatolites. And I'm going to show you those two stromatolites. Here they are. Here's one from uh, Nevada, age unknown. And here's one that grew in, in that hot spring in Yellowstone. These are millimeters for scale. Uh, these are plotted at the same scale. And I think that if you pointed the rover's camera at that and that, you would probably say they're pretty similar. We can, talk, we can see differences, but in terms of what they are, I don't think anybody would have a problem calling either one of these a stromatolite. However, we already know this one's made of cyanobacteria uh, because we see those fossils uh, in the structure. We see them living on top of the structure, and we watched it grow. We literally farm these in Yellowstone. We grow them, so we watch them grow. This, on the other hand, when I take a thin section of it, and put it in cross-polarized light, we see these lines. Those are uh, highlighting crystallinity. And what we're seeing is that is not a, a stack of ancient microbial mats. That is a bunch of crystals creating a crystal fan. And if we look at it um, sort of closer, we can see it has no evidence of life whatsoever. There's no organic matter at all. It's just a stack of crystals. Now, did I pick the only one on Earth that looks like that? No, there are other examples like this. I like this one because this view looks so much like that. So much so that a famous mineralogist who was recently mentioned borrowed this from my website and used it as a stromatolite, probably not realizing that it's abiotic. Anyway. Um, context is also important. This one grew in a hot spring with uh, microbial mat on top of it. This one grew in what was a hydrothermal vein. This is the regional bedding. These are Devonian rocks. Uh, and then this is a crack going through those rocks. And it's, it's a vein fill. It's growing out this way, and it's growing out this way. That's where these came from. They came from deep within the Earth uh, in a hydrothermal vein. So context is also important. Here we know it's surrounded by life. Here it likely um, wasn't, and it wasn't constructed by life. 
So I got a lot of pushback in 2008. It's like, well, Frank thinks all stromatolites are abiotic. It's like, no, please, no. I grow them. I know that there, there are many, if not most, stromatolites are uh, biogenic structures. But when you see something that, like that and you're looking for life elsewhere, you've got to take it into account, right? And so uh, it's a cautionary tale. But like I said, I had people coming up to me um, say, well, that was a, that's kind of a bummer. <laughs> you're, you're like ruining stromatolites. <laughs> um, so I've spent the last sort of, um, well, since 2008, turning it around and saying, well, what can we look at in a stromatolite that absolutely tells us it's a biogenic structure. Our bias might be that it is a biogenic structure, but what is the evidence beyond it looks like one? Okay, what is the evidence beyond it just looks biogenic? Um, so we'll call these hallmarks of life. Maybe that's too grand of a term. I think these are things that would make me think, okay, is it abiogenic? Is it biogenic? These are things that would sort of make me swing towards it's, it's on the biogenic side. So I'm going to go over three examples. These aren't necessarily the most important examples or the best examples, but they illustrate our thought process. And I think, uh, like Karen was saying, the thought process is super important. And one of the things I hope to learn from all of you is, well, how do you think about the problem? Because that will then allow me to evolve and my thinking, and hopefully I can do the same for you. Um, so let's look at these three things, grains trapped beyond the angle of slide, magnetic susceptibility, and bubbles. Uh, and of course, none of this was done alone, nor mostly by me. These are my former students. Um, I believe all of them are professors now. I'm very proud of them. Um, so let's start with grains beyond, trapped beyond the angle of slide. And uh, I'm also very proud that we, we got the cover of Geobiology with this study. Um, let's ask the question, what can uh, cyanobacteria trap and bind? So if they're building these layers, you know, what, what can they trap and bind? Um, and you know, is the, what they can trap and bind, you, does it have utility as a biosignature? So here's what we did. Here's that mat again. We collected microbial mats from Catalina Harbor. We grew them up in the tanks at Wrigley. Get some water here. Seeing all this water makes me thirsty. We used very sophisticated sampling techniques on the mud flat to collect these mats. Spatula. Um, and then we brought it back. We grew them up uh, and did some experiments. And this was done in association with the International Geobiology Summer Course. And then um, it was continued by several of my former grad students, Carrie Franz and Victoria Patrician, uh, who are both now professors. OK, so um, what we did is we cut the mats into little coupons, put them in these little dishes, and we inclined them at different angles. Because as you saw in those pictures of stromatolites, you know, the, the layers, they, they can be just gentle domes, they could be conical, they could be very steeply domed. Um, and you can imagine uh, that if you just sprinkle sediment on something, it will create a pile and it will create a distinctive angle. As you, if you just picked up sand and let it drop, it falls into a pile and the, the sand piles up at a particular angle, which is called what? Angle of repose. Um, so the angle of slide is similar. It's not identical, but it's similar that if you then deliver more sand, will it fall off the edge or will it continue to build up? And so we inclined these coupons of mat at different angles from angles that were within the angle of slide and angles uh, that were beyond it. Uh, and we delivered different size materials, fine, medium, and coarse grains. We, of course, first did this with an abiotic control uh, where a, the, it had no mat on it. And we can see there's that angle of repose or angle of slide. 
So this is the angle of inclination, and this is how many grains were trapped. And so see how it goes from lots of grains trapped to not very many grains trapped? So that is the angle of slide right there. In this system, it's around 40 degrees or so. So anything in this area up here is going to be better than abiotic. OK, so let's now look at the mats and see how they did. OK, so anything up in this area of the white on these graphs is going to be indicative of better than abiotic. Everybody with me? OK. So here, here are the th three grain sizes, fine, medium, and coarse. And you can see that with fine grains, the cyanobacteria had absolutely no problem trapping them beyond the angle of slide. So that could be a biosignature, because if you just delivered it to an abiotic system, it would just fall off. OK, so um, they had a little bit more trouble with medium, but they still did an OK job. And they were not able, in our experiment, to trap and bind uh, coarse grains. Uh, we also did algae, which are much bigger. I don't have the results on this slide. They were very good at trapping the bigger grains. Not so good at trapping the smaller grains. Um, but anyway, this concept of you know something that, in the absence of life, you wouldn't expect to see it. So I think that could be a potential biosignature. So we can look back in the ancient record and see what do we see. So here is a stromatolite. Uh, it's a thin section of a stromatolite from the Green River Formation. And it has very steep laminae along this bank. And then they come up like this. Do you see that? And it is mostly fine grain. That dark brown material is what a geologist would call micrite. It's carbonate mud. It's very, very fine grained. But we can see this environment. So the stromatolite was growing in an environment that had lots of coarser grains in it. And occasionally, those got incorporated into the stromatolite. And you can see them along these steep laminae. So I think I consider that pushing the pendulum towards the side of being uh, a biotic indicator. I probably would have looked at this stromatolite in the field and thought, that's, that's, an e that's evidence for life. But this is going one step further than just, I think it's evidence. Now we have additional evidence. Um, the problem here is that not all stromatolites uh, are in environments where these uh, larger grains might be that would be indicative of something beyond the angle of slide. Because we saw before, you know, you could have an abiotic precipitate that, that looks like a stromatolite. And, you know, it wouldn't be sticky. It's just, it's just in this case, a calcite, a mineral. Um, so we could have that. And how do we know, you know if that's been uh, changed by diagenesis, how do we know that was originally abiotic or not? So let's look at a, another potential indicator using the same sort of hypothesis, uh, looking for grains beyond the angle of a repose or angle of slide, except something that would work in a fine grain setting where we can't really see the grains very well. So in this case, we turn to the, the idea of magnetic susceptibility. So magnetic susceptibility is a way to measure very, 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 very tiny amounts of magnetic field. Um, and it turns out that you know, in the surface environment on Earth, certainly after the Great Oxidation event, but perhaps in certain environments before, certainly after, there's going to be dust. And that dust is going to have magnetic particles in it. It's going to have iron minerals in it. And those can get blown uh, as dust. This is uh, uh, Africa here. And this is a plume of dust heading towards the Bahamas. OK, so we see that dust ending up on the carbonate platform in the Bahamas. So we see this process happening today where uh, very fine grain magnetic particles could be delivered to a stromatolite. And we did the same experiment. Here we have. Um, an abiotic stromatolite that we uh, grew in the lab. We precipitated while delivering fine grain magnetic particles. This was our hypothesis, that we might see them sticking at the tops, but they're not going to be able to stick on the sides, and they'll end up in between. 
And when we did that same analysis, uh, in this case, this is uh, the dip angle again, but on this axis, instead of percent grain, it's um, magnetic susceptibility as a proxy for these magnetic particles. But you see the same uh, patterns. This was the abiogenic uh, control, and this is the biogenic control from those mats on Catalina. And you can see there's all kinds of uh, particles that uh, are in that white field, which is better than abiotic. So we can use this to go back and look at ancient stromatolites too. It's not going to work in all systems, but if the, if the conditions are right, it will work. So here we have um, our Yellowstone stromatolite, which we know is biogenic because we watched it grow, and it's made of cyanobacterial uh, casts. And you can see a, a perfect signal all, along every um, angle we see there is significant magnetic material. Um, so that's, e even at very high angles, these mats are sticky enough to adhere these, uh, um, ad adhere these particles. I think that could be a biosignature. Here's that one we talked about before with the, uh, um, with the bigger particles. We see the exact same pattern. So we see it in the big particles, and we see it in the f with the fine fraction these uh, fine magnetics. Uh, here's a very interesting one, also from the Green River Formation, where this, in thin section, this area here, is more akin to that abiogenic example I showed you before. This is a mix between micrite, the dark, and abiotic. And then up here, we have micritic, um, purely micrite, or purely mud um, laminate. And you can see that the micrite area uh, did way better than abiotic. Um, the fan did not, and the mixed was in the middle. So in one stromatolite, we have uh, both abiogenic processes and biogenic processes happening, and, and then in some cases, very finely interclated and mixed. Again, this is just an example of a thought process I'm showing you some results to demonstrate that. And the final one I want to talk about today is uh, something that we might not think about being along a lamination in an abiogenic stromatolite, and that is a bubble. So for example, here's a picture of one of our experiments from Catalina, and you can see those oxygen bubbles uh, trapped in the mat and occasionally, things like that can get preserved. Here's a thin section of that stromatolite I keep showing you from Yellowstone. The blue is indicating pore space. So empty space was stained blue. So the epoxy was stained blue. So if you see blue, it's pore space. Uh, bottom line, this is very porous. <laughs> but these are the stromatolite laminate. Again, you can see the the light laminae where the filaments are standing up and the dark laminae where they're lying down. If you're thinking that sounds like a day-night cycle, it probably is. They skip days sometimes, though. They're very cranky sometimes. So if you watch them over the course of a year, there won't be a, a every day. There's a light-dark couplet, but it's just about every day. But you might see there are some areas that have additional features. So let's zoom in on that. Along this laminate, we see these circles with little uh, threads going through. Here's a zoom in on one of those. So this is pore space. And can you see the microbial filaments? These are microbial filaments. We call this an hourglass structure. We have empty space here, empty space here. And there's the hourglass structure in between. These are essentially um, casts of these bubbles. Um, and probably one of my favorite images of all time is this one. This is an SEM image of the same thing. So uh, these are weakly mineralized. So uh, it's a silica system. So these are weakly mineralized with silica. And that is an empty space where there used to be a bubble. Um, now, maybe there are environments where there are bubbles being released, like serpentinization, would that produce bubbles? Right, would that end up in a accreting 
mineral stromatolite? I don't know. I don't think so. So I, I sort of look at this like that's, in the absence of anything else, that would push me towards, no, that's probably a biogenic structure. We see these in the ancient. Here's an example from the uh, early Triassic in Great Britain. Uh, here's an example from the Cambrian, approximately 500 million years ago, where we see um, these would be you know, the leftover remnants of the biogenic structure. These were once holes or fenestrae, probably left behind by these gases. And it's now filled in with a carbonate cement. So in your mind, if you want to remove this stuff, that's what it, that used to be an ancient void, um, probably as a result of these uh, gassy mats. Uh, here's an example from the Archean. Uh, again, uh, in your mind, remove this and remove this. And just think of this part as empty space. And you see these cuspate structures. We see those in the Yellowstone stromatolites, where the bubble breaks. And this is an example from the Archean. OK, so just to sum this part up, um, I think grains beyond the angle of slide help me to look at a stromatolite and say, yeah, that's evidence for life beyond the fact that it's just a stromatolite all along. Uh, magnetic susceptibility allows us to do the same kind of thing, but in fine-grained systems. It's not going to work in all systems, but in many carbonate-dominated systems, it probably would work. I think structures like bubbles um, are things to look for that, that would say one way or the other. And these are just you know, a few things in this toolkit that we're building that will hopefully build more during this seminar uh, or during this uh, week you know, to help us decide, are we looking at a sign of life or not? Um, so I think stromatolites can be abiogenic or biogenic. I mean, there's famous papers by Grotzinger and Rothman, Grotzinger and Knoll, and others that have hinted at this um, for many years. And it came home for me when I saw that example from Nevada that was like, oh, it's a, you know, it looks like a stromatolite, but it's just a abiotic crystal fan. So they're not always evidence of life. It's still a cautionary tale, but hopefully you're not bummed like the people were back in 2008 when I was saying, you know, you got to be careful. Um, and, you know, what happens if we find one on Mars? It'll probably be the most exciting day of my life if that ever happens. But then the arguments start, right? Is it, is it a real stromatolite or is it an abiogenic structure? Uh, and I was also asked to comment on, you know, where, where, what are things we have to worry about? Where do we have to go? Um, one of the things I worry about a lot is a concept of diagenesis. And diagenesis is a word geologists use to indicate post, what happens after something forms. So post-depositional alteration. It could be physical compaction. It could be chemical dissolution of things, reprecipitation of other things, recrystallization. The bottom line is you start out with what could have been a pretty good record of an ancient environment, potentially with life. And then it gets worse and worse and worse as diagenesis proceeds. And the older something is, the more time there is to have, from my perspective, bad things happen. I know if there's a metamorphic petrologist in the audience, you might think uh, rocks enjoy metamorphism. I say they suffer metamorphism. <laughs> so in the modern, we can do all this. We can get DNA, RNA, pH, salinity, nutrients, isotopes, all that stuff. So imagine this is like your delicious frosty Coke that you can pour and then drink and taste and you know everything about it. But as we go back in time, well, what happens if you only have the can? What, can you, what do you know? What can you learn? Or you go farther back in time, what if you have that? If I have time at the end, I'll show you where this came from. OK, so these are things we need to think about. These are things we need uh, to worry about, especially if we're looking at uh, ancient life versus an extant life. But honestly, I think even in extant systems, Alteration of biosignatures is still a topic we need to uh, grapple with. Um, I alluded to a pendulum earlier, 
And this is something that Scott and I and, and other um, people I've interacted with over the years have discussed as it's the way I think about biosignatures. It's like you, you give me something and I'm right here in the middle. I don't know what it is. And then I look for evidence. Am I swinging the pendulum towards the biogenic side? Is there evidence like those grains at high angles? Or is it going this way? Is it a stack of crystal fans? It's just the way I think. And I thought I would show this because I'm going to say it the whole, all, all week. So I figured I would just show this is how I think about biosignatures. Um, the original title of this talk had the word proof in it, the proof of microbial life. And as a scientist, I struggle with that word proof. It's like, is there ever proof proof when you're looking at something ancient? Um, so for me, it's like, does it go this way or does it come this way? That's the way I think about it. And you know, Scott showed us uh, you know, something, you know, a more evolved version of that when we had our uh, preliminary uh, Zoom a few weeks ago. So this is something I think we'll probably end up talking a lot about uh, during, this, um, during this week. Okay, so with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions.